Good evening and welcome to the It's All Break To Me blog tour. I'm Dr. Paul Caritas and uh, this is week four of the tour and uh, this week as well as next week we'll be looking at uh, a few important uh, metaphysical thinkers in classical thought and uh, today's lesson and Wednesday's lesson are based on Pythagoras of Samos and uh, this is this over here is the School of Athens, uh, it's by Raphael, and in it we can see some of the important metaphysical thinkers. The one that we'll be dealing with today is right here. Yeah, that's Pythagoras over there. So, okay, so today we'll be uh, discussing um, whether he was a philosopher, a mystic, or a shaman. Um, and uh, we'll also be attempting to make sense out of uh, the various natures that have been attributed to him. Uh, was he a philosopher, a mystic, or a shaman? As I've said, also, uh, we'll have to take note that we uh, actually have no primary sources when it comes to Pythagoras. Uh, his writings, of course, have not uh, survived the test of time. Um, what we know of him uh, comes from secondary sources attributed to such uh, authorities as a uh, Proclus, uh, Porphyry, uh, Nicomachus, uh, Theon of Smyrna, Clement of uh, Alexandria, and uh, Aristotle. Uh, the time preceding the birth of Pythagoras is uh, marked uh, by a preternatural light. For a legend propagated by the islanders of Samos centuries beforehand uh, spoke of the coming of a godson who'd succeed in gaining knowledge of the divine or the one through the intellect an evolutionary step away from jungle instinct and into a mystical contemplation which would benefit the whole of humankind. It is believed that even the Delphic bee, the Pythia, had foreseen his divine birth. When the father and mother of Pythagoras, Mnesicus and Parthenis, consulted the oracle on matters concerning travel to Syria, the voice of Apollo uh, disregarded the question posed and instead spoke of the far-reaching consequences that would ensue as a result of the beauty and wisdom of their soon-to-be-born son. When it comes to the great thinkers of the world, it can sometimes be excruciatingly difficult to separate legend from history, uh, fact from fiction. More often than not, we find that they are apotheosized after their deaths, raised to a status above that of mere mortals. But Pythagoras differs in that he seemed to enjoy this luxury whilst he was still alive. A great many sources claim that he was a brute of a specimen, he was significantly tall and imposing, and unlike other men, his masculine energy, personal magnetism, and physical prowess appeared to increase rather than diminish with time. These virtues were well balanced by a cultivated psyche, an ingenious mind, and a nifty, outspoken tongue that attracted to itself either the reverence and awe, or the enmity and jealousy of its subjects. I suppose his disposition was such that it served as a breeding ground for all sorts of interesting superstitions about him. Many believed that he was immaculately conceived, that he had a golden thigh, and that he was tuned to the music of the spheres, the harmonic sounds that issued from the planetary spheres as they traversed the heavens. Others went further by asserting that he possessed magical or hypnotic powers. Merely by thinking it, Pythagoras could cause a flock of birds to change their migratory path tame a wild animal, such as a boar or wolf, cause change in the habitual diet of any creature and attract to himself the affinity of a white eagle. Even the elements were subject to his mighty will. He could call forth spirits inhabiting other dimensions to cause ripples or vibrations on the surface of a pond. One time, his meditative prayer to a water spirit was actually answered with the words, Pythagoras, I greet thee. The godlike image and powers of Pythagoras, built upon centuries of worship, are reminiscent of a middle-aged genius in the physician and alchemist Paracelsus of Hohenheim. Like the former, Paracelsus was alleged to have traversed Europe astride a beautiful white horse, to have regained his youth by sealing a fortune packed with malevolent demons, and to have stored ample amounts of the ruby-red philosopher's stone, or the elixir of life, inside the pommel of his sword. Stranger still, many residents of Salzburg claimed that he had returned from the dead on, on numerous occasions to bequeath cures for certain untreatable conditions and diseases. 
All too often we find that the propensity of the human imagination uh, to idolise and worship renders myth and legend far more memorable than the actual lifetime achievements of the man or woman in question. The legends no doubt confer something of a supernatural aura. A man who understood the fundamental unity, mechanics and the harmonic arrangement of matter in the cosmos and used divination uh, as to demonstrate its occult principles. But before we go on to examine Pythagoras' original contributions to the growing pool of knowledge, it is important to scour his life and discern what may have been borrowed from three other primordial civilizations which lay to the south and east of Greece, intellectual property which he no doubt would have presented as his own upon establishing his own secret and esoteric school in Crotona, a, Hellen a, Hellen a Hellenic settlement in Italy. We know that he was born in the early decades of the 6th century BCE, probably in about 570 BCE, a period in which humanity's consciousness had ripened just enough to be receptive to the spiritual teachings dispersed in India by the Buddha and in China by Confucius and Lao Tse. What spurred Pythagoras to travel for a good 34 years or so is uncertain, though it's likely that it transpired at the bidding of Polycrates, the tyrant of Samos, who took a liking to the uh, metaphysical protege. The latter's alliance uh, to Egypt proved advantageous, for it gave Pythagoras access to Egyptian esoteric knowledge, uh, esoteric knowledge, excuse me, which would have otherwise been inaccessible. Um, pharaoh Amasis, Egypt's last indigenous pharaoh, facilitated a safe transfer to Thebes, where he was, among other things, circumcised and then initiated into the mysteries of Isis at the hands of the powerful Theban priesthood. Uh, that the harmonic arrangements of the cosmos can be described through mathematical formula uh, he would have learned from the Egyptian priests. Uh, their sacred science would have remained hidden to all but those initiated into the mysteries. It was an all-encompassing science which syncretized astronomy, philosophy, mathematics and music and taught that all laws, principles and quantities of nature are fractions of one, the largest mathematical number. By gaining instruction in the symbolism, the placement of the bas-reliefs, the measurements and proportions, and the axes and orientations of the Temple of Amun Mut Khons in Thebes, Pythagoras gained knowledge of the equation relating to the square of the hypotenuse, which would later be ascribed to him, as well as other mathematical formula supporting the notion that identical laws and relationships govern both the macrocosm, and by macrocosm we mean man, and the, and the microcosm, uh, sorry, macrocosm we mean uh, co the cosmos, and microcosm, which is man. This knowledge of the geometrical governance of all of nature enabled the Egyptians to erect pyramids, obelisks, and megalithic temples. A lamentable turn of fate saw the fall of Egypt at the hands of the Persians, and Pythagoras was henceforth sent to the valley of the Euphrates, to Babylon, by the Persian king Cambyses. While he was there, he was initiated to the Mesopotamian mysteries. The Persian Magi unveiled the anatomy of the heavens as seen through the kaleidoscope of Chaldean astronomy. In those times, there was no distinguishable difference between astronomy and astrology, and the Chaldean school was an astrophilosophical system which aimed to chart, interpret, and predict the movement of planetary bodies and constellations, assigned, assign character and behavioral traits to the latter, and unite these two streams of thought as to create a mutually dependent and holistic conception of the cosmos, linking the heavens above and the earth below. In this working framework, character and behavioural traits of each individual could be understood in the context of their chosen path of descent through a specific constellation at the time of their birth. It's worthy to note here that astrology is the more experientially viable and investigative of the esoteric traditions. Those who delve into the primordial tradition one of the first sciences known to man will quickly come to the conclusion that there is uncanny truth to its predictions. I, for one, know of a great many writers, poets and playwrights born under the astrological sign of cancer, eminent soldiers and leaders born under Sagittarius, and mathematical geniuses and quick-witted individuals born under Gemini. Anybody with a passing acquaintance uh, with astrology will know that the character traits mentioned correspond with the nature of the ruling planets. Uh, the Moon, Jupiter, and uh, Mercury, respectively. Having penetrated into Hindustan, there can be no doubt that Pythagoras would have run into the Indian sages who contemplated Brahman by projection into the invisible realms and communion with the invisible beings that inhabit them. The doctrine of reincarnation or metempsychosis 
which attempts to demarcate the soul's destiny, appears to have infiltrated Pythagorean ideology towards the end of his life. Modern scholars are convinced that it was derived directly from Oriental mysticism, reformulated and then regurgitated with his own philosophical bent when he began teaching his doctrines and uh, initiating candidates into his esoteric school at Crotona. There seems to be some con uh, confusion around what Pythagoras actually was and how he might have identified during uh, the course of his travels and when he established himself at Crotona afterwards. While it is true that he immersed himself in mysticism and divination, his primary aim was to grasp the prime cause, the one, which pervaded all and infused all matter with life through intellectual contemplation. Nowadays we would argue that intellect alone cannot fully grasp the divine, for the former mimics the physical senses in that it can only give a flat, two-dimensional rendition of a multi-dimensional, all-encompassing and numinous provenance. provenance sorry. Nevertheless, his practical and experiential approach to the intangible divine uh, was original and unique, a method of inquiry into phenomena which he called philosophy. In fact, Pythagoras was the first man to call himself a philosopher, a word which transcribes to lover of wisdom in Greek. Major changes have unveiled, had unveiled on Samos during the years that Pythagoras was away. He returned to an island on which the repressive despotism that he had that had rooted itself there uh, decades before under Polycrates had grown increasingly intolerant of critical inquiry. Uh, Pythagoras cut his losses and moved to Crotona in Italy, where he established Europe's, Europe's first philosophical and esoteric school. Its primary focus was to confer cosmic secrets upon those he deemed worthy and able to receive them through a three-tiered system of initiation. Neophytes were forbidden to ask questions and had to listen to discourse given by Pythagoras from behind the curtain. The greats themselves, Mathematicus, Theoreticus and Electus, each cultivated proficiency in arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy, uh, denominations of inquiry that formed the triangular foundation of the cosmos and instilled the individual with the requisite knowledge needed to facilitate an experience of illumination or uh, apathanathismos, as we call it in Greek mystical communion with the divine. He imposed an obligatory oath of silence to all his students, lest this powerful knowledge be misconstrued or misused by those who had neither the talent nor the moral compass for it. All esoteric and secret brotherhoods, such as the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians that came afterwards, varied in the style and type of rituals they employed and in the content of their teachings, but all were united under the aegis of the Pythagorean veil of secrecy. And here we will uh, conclude today's lesson and continue with Pythagoras on Wednesday for part two of uh, Pythagoras of Samos, shaman, mystic or philosopher. See you then.